If you didn't know, it's Pentecost Sunday. If you don't know what Pentecost is, you need to read your Bibles, praise God. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit contract. I use the word contract because it's really the Holy Spirit covenant, but I try to steer away sometimes from churchy words because we don't really use the word covenant a lot in our um, everyday talk in society. So I want to talk to you a little bit about the Holy Spirit contract. Uh, I, want, I, I always love to talk about the Holy Spirit, so Pentecost Sunday is just an even greater excuse to really emphasize that point. But what I want you to think about as we go through this stuff today is maybe the things that you were taught if you grew up in the church in Sunday school or maybe you were at a previous church. Before I found out about the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I was just missing so much. And really, churches that aren't teaching this, I'm not, I'm not condemning them, but I'm saying, how many of you know you can only teach what you know, right? And so that's why when, when, when the, the Romans were putting Jesus to death, he cried out to the Father, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. There's things that I preached five years ago that I wouldn't preach today because I've had revelation about it or I've changed my mind about that because I saw it in the word. That, uh, so I think it's okay for us as human beings to realize we're not going to get it 100% all the time. So I don't fault churches that are not teaching this because my assumption is they've never been taught it because how bad would that be if they were taught it and decide for the sake of not wanting to offend people or not wanting to be the weirdo church, they just decide to not teach on that stuff to, for the sake of drawing more people. There's going to be accountability for that in heaven someday. But I really believe that most people don't teach this stuff is because they simply didn't know, just like I didn't know. But I'm just going to come right out in the gate and say it. The new covenant that we have or the contract that we have with God is the Holy Spirit. A lot of people think it's Jesus. Now, Jesus is the sacrifice that ushered in the new covenant. And I always say it like this. The old covenant was what? Anybody know? Just shout it out. What was the old covenant? The law, right. So it was something that God took and gave to us. And then Moses had to sprinkle the entire camp with blood because blood was the thing that basically put the covenant into play. And so people think that Jesus is the covenant, but he's not. He is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world to ratify the new covenant spirit that we've been given. And Jesus talks about this over and over again. He says, listen, I have to go through this, and then I'm going to rise, and then I must go so that the Father can send you the Holy Spirit. And I want to show you with the early scriptures, and then we're going to see everywhere in John um, and also First John about the purpose of the Holy Spirit. But I want to show you to get you to the idea that the new covenant, many people are say is, oh, well, that's, you know, that's Jesus and, and the sacrifice on the cross and it's forgiveness of sins. It is forgiveness of sins. But how many of you know you had to be cleansed of your sins so that the Holy One could come and live on the inside of you? And that's the giving, that's the covenant. And it's prophesied in the Old Testament, and it's also in the New, it's spoken of again to say, hey, that thing that was prophesied a long time ago, this is what we're living in. So let's go to the first slide. Um, these should all be in your notes, so if you have your app, they should all be um, printed out. The reason how, why I have Hebrews and Acts in parentheses, and we're, and we're going to see it, is that Jeremiah is quoted in Hebrews. Jeremiah is Old Testament. Hebrews is New Testament. Joel is Old Testament. They're both prophets. And, and Peter, at Pentecost, quotes Joel 2, 28 through 32. But in Acts, that's a quote from Joel. Does that make sense? So let's start in Jeremiah so that we can see that prophetically what Jeremiah spoke concerning the day of the new covenant. I'll give you a minute to get there. Otherwise, like I said, if you have the app, you can just pull it up. It's in the notes. Okay, here we go. 
Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Everybody say new. We're going to find out why this is so important later. A new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers. So apparently the new covenant is not like the old. Which I made with their fathers on the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, although I was like a husband to them, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days. And we are now in those days. I will put my law inside them. And I will write it on their heart. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Look at 34. They will not teach again each one his neighbor and each one his brother saying, Know the Lord. For they will all know me from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoings and their sin I will no longer remember. So there's some important things in this. It's a new covenant. It's not like the old covenant. It's going to be for everybody. And and he specifically says, I will put my laws inside them and I will write it on their hearts. Why is he saying that? Because that is a contrast to here is written the Ten Commandments, which the finger of God wrote. And then there was a whole bunch of ordinances that went with it. I believe it's like 616. That's a lot to memorize. But he's saying it's not like that. It's going to be on the inside of you. And then there's some crazy statements in here, like they don't need to teach people, his neighbor, his brother, saying, know the Lord. For all will know me. All means in the Hebrew, all. So you know Hebrew is as good as your Greek. Excellent. From the least to the greatest of them. So everyone is going to, quote unquote, know the Lord. For I will forgive their wrongdoing and their sin I will no longer remember. Now there's the part of the covenant that is the forgiveness of sins. But it also has a previous part that talks about writing on our hearts and putting his laws on the inside of us. And so in Hebrews, I want to show you something interesting, and because I said we're going to highlight the fact that this is the new covenant. So if you go to Hebrews chapter 8, now you can read 8 through 12, but it's just quoting Jeremiah, so I'm going to skip that. So it's the writer of Hebrews, which people don't know who that is. People presume it's Paul, but we're not sure. And it's written specifically to the Hebrews. The the thing that gives that away is the book is called Hebrews. Now, that doesn't mean that us as Gentiles can't learn from it. It's just understanding that that book was specifically written to Jews because there is a lot of stuff in there about Melchizedek and the law and what we have now in the New Covenant. But look at verse 13. So after he says a new, he says this, when he said, quote, a new covenant or a new contract, he has made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete, that word can also be translated old, old and obsolete, everything that is becoming old and obsolete And then he uses the word, the other term in the Hebrew, which is growing old, he says, is about to disappear. Now, this is so important. I don't hear a lot of people talking about this. I hear grace people talking about it, which is great because they should be preaching it. This verse is scary for many people because it's like, well, wait a second. Are you saying that we shouldn't teach the Ten Commandments? Are you saying that we shouldn't, we should just throw away the Old Testament? Are you saying, I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying If the writer of Hebrews and Jeremiah the prophet, who most people understand in the Old Testament, God spoke to prophets, and when prophets spoke, God was speaking through them. So it wasn't just Jeremiah was saying, God was saying 
that there is a new covenant coming. And so the writer of Hebrews says, when God says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. It's old. And whatever is obsolete and growing old is about ready to disappear. Hebrews was written almost 2,000 years ago. So if it was old and getting ready to disappear then, I'm telling you today, brothers and sisters, it should be gone. And people are like, what are you saying? I'm saying what the writer of Hebrews is saying, and I'm saying what God is saying. But see, people, again, many of you who grew up in like Sunday school and that kind of stuff, are like, well, wait a second, we learned the Ten Commandments. Some of us sang songs to memorize the Ten Commandments. But it's so funny because most people, when they're like, oh, the Ten Commandments is so important, I'm like, what's number eight? They don't know. I'm like, oh, it's really important. But everyone knows, for God so loved the world. Even the fans at the Cubs games know that. The Sox, sorry. Okay, so you get my point, is that the, the law is for people that do not live in the covenant of grace. If you don't want to live in the covenant of grace, that's fine. You can keep the Ten Commandments, but let me remind you, brothers and sisters, even if you're able to keep all ten, which I guarantee no one in this room has, you have 616 other laws you have to keep also. How many of you like, uh, like shrimp and lobster and that kind of stuff? Let me see hands. If you live under the law, you can't eat that stuff anymore. You like bacon? That's gone. You like pork chops? That's gone. You're going to have to change your whole diet if you want to live under the law. And people are like, well, no, 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 no. It's not that he freed us from the law, the Ten Commandments. It's he freed us from all of those ordinances. That's not what the Bible says. He either gave us a new covenant or you choose to not live in the new covenant and live in the old covenant. And the Bible says if you offend in one area of the law, you've broken the whole thing. But yet today, I hear, and, and again, I'm saying this in love because remember, my big disclaimer, they probably just don't know. But I can't tell you how many pastors I meet that they're emphasizing, well, we got to live righteous, we got to live moral, we got to live by the Ten Commandments. Well, of course you want to live righteous and holy. But the law is not going to produce that because if it did, then we don't need Jesus. I think proof positive of the Israelites when they got the law in Exodus, if you read from Exodus all the way up to when Jesus shows up on the scene, it's pretty bad. How, we, we don't need more thousands of years to prove that the law doesn't work. And again, the Bible says the law is holy, it is right, it is righteous, but it is given to a people who are fallen. And so Jesus came to fulfill the law. He lived out everything perfectly. He was sinless. He did everything. And then by that, he died. He took our place so that he would receive all of our punishment for the sins that we've committed under the law and that we would receive all of the righteousness because he committed no sin under the law. That's the gospel. To try to teach people going, oh, yeah, 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 we're free in Jesus, but you know what? We really need to strive to follow the Ten Commandments. There's nowhere that that's written. And people are like, well, if we don't know the law, then how do we know if we're keeping God's law? Well, here's a good indicator. The Bible says in the New Covenant to love others as I have loved you. Did Jesus ever steal from you? Did he ever murder you? Okay, you see what I'm saying? We can go down the line and everything is fulfilled in love. And in Galatians, we talked about the fruit of the Spirit, that it says, against such things there is no law. If you're living in the Spirit, if you're living in the contract of the new covenant Spirit, you don't have to worry about keeping the law because you are keeping it because you are in the Spirit. But this mixture stuff, God is not for that. You even talk about it. You can't put new wine into old wineskins. What is he talking about? We have to, that's why he says, repent and be baptized. And let me tell you, brothers and sisters, and I'm sure you know this, there's a lot of people that want Jesus, but don't want to repent. And it don't work that way. 
You can't go, well, I, I, I want Jesus, but I still want to do all of these other things. That's not the gospel. When Peter gets up and preaches in Acts, he says, he's, he gives this great thing. He talks about Jesus dying on the cross, and he says, listen, Joel 2, 28, and we're going to read that. This is what happened, and he says, and this thing that you see in here is what Joel was talking about, and it says they were all cut to the heart, and they said, what do we do in order to be saved? So Peter gives this great message, and they're like, what do we do now? And the very first thing was not believe in Jesus. The very first word is repent. And that word repent means to change your mind, change your outlook on life. In the Greek, the Hebrew understanding is action. That's why John the Baptist, when he's standing and he's baptizing and he sees all these people coming out, John wasn't very tactful. He sees all these people coming to get baptized, and he's like, man, you guys are, are sons of snakes and serpents. Who told you to escape the wrath that's coming? And you know, they're just like, man, we just want to get baptized by you. And he says to them, listen, you want to be baptized by me, then you get baptized, but you better show, he uses the word, fruits of repentance. And so we have a whole generation of people that are like, I love Jesus, I love Jesus, but are out living whatever lifestyle they want. And they're like, I'm under grace, I'm under grace, I'm under grace. It's not true. The Bible says sin shall not have dominion or be master over you because you are not under law but under grace. So if sin is running you ragged, you're under the law because the reverse statement is true. People that are filled with the Spirit and, want and go after the Spirit do not do those things. I'm not saying you're going to live it perfectly, but I'm saying it should not be constant. Make sense? So John says, bear fruits of repentance. And so they're getting baptized, and they're like, okay, John, this is John the Baptist, what, what do we do? And they said, listen, if you're a tax collector... I understand you're collecting for Caesar, but stop ripping off your own people. Collect what you're supposed to collect, because tax collectors could tell you whatever it was. If Caesar was collecting 300 bucks, they could be like, yeah, Caesar says it's five, and then they'd just take 200 of your money and put it in their pocket and just give the three to Caesar. That's what was going on. And he says, don't do that anymore. It wasn't, have a revelation. It was, stop it. Sometimes, you know, people are like, well, I don't know, Pastor, da, 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 da. what do you think I should do? I think you should stop it. Well, but you don't understand. No, you don't understand. Stop it. We live in such a, I don't know if this is politically correct, sissified generation. Sissies. And everybody said? I mean, my goodness. Beer companies are having men that think they're women promote beer. And, and, you know, most of people, I'm assuming this is such a stereotype, that drink Bud Light probably don't want to see that because that's not the most expensive beer on the planet. Target. Did you see what happened at Target? Now, but see, people, if we respond, they will respond. They still have that display, but now it's in the back. You know, the, the tuck swimsuits, have you heard about this? They have a whole display. They have a whole line of pride stuff in kids' sizes. But because of the backlash for it, it was up front. They've moved it to the back. I haven't been to this Target because I don't shop at Target. Unless I really need cherries. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds so weak. But, but here's the, so I'm saying I haven't been in there to see the display is my point. But because of the backlash, they've moved it to the back. And isn't this just funny? I'm just going to get off on this tangent. I don't care. Isn't it funny that, like, I don't know why the woke people aren't all upset. Because if the pride people, this is like, you know, the, the, the 21st century, um, you know, like what, what uh, Martin Luther King did for that movement. You know, all the pride people are putting themselves in the same movement that is all discrimination and this kind of stuff, which is absolutely garbage because they choose to do that. People with a different skin color did choose their skin color. 
But can you believe it? I mean, what was going on in, in the civil rights movement? What were they doing? They would make people of different colors sit in the back of the bus, right? That was a discrimination. Well, Target put it all right in the front, and then because of the backlash, they basically put them in the back of the store. That seems a little discriminatory to me. So why isn't the woke people just as mad as the conservative people and Target just go out of business? Amen. I'm going to get back to this, but this world is so crazy. That's why we need to be in the spirit. Okay, so coming back. So, so Peter's quoting Joel, and he's saying all of these things. So let's go to Joel 2.28, because this is about the new covenant spirit that Peter is talking about. So we have to understand, again, my point was about getting off on that tangent and all that, is we need to repent. We can't just say, I want Jesus and live my life the way I want. You need to repent. John says, bring forth fruits of repentance. And somebody else is like, what do we do? And he said, do you have two coats? Oh, yeah, I've got two coats. Then give one away to somebody who has none. So in the Hebrew mindset, repentance was a doing, which is why I was saying, like, stop it. We don't get that because we're a Greek mindset and we have to have some kind of great revelation and thinking it through and doing all the equations to figure out if we should actually stop sinning or not instead of just stop it. That's what repent is. Stop doing what you're doing and come over here and do this instead. So Joel 2.28. This is the prophecy of the Spirit, which Peter quotes in Acts. It will come about after this that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. All flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will have dreams. Your young men will see visions. If you're having prophetic dreams, you are old. Because it says old men will dream dreams. So if you're seeing visions, then you're still young. It's a joke. Okay. And even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will display wonders in the sky and on the earth, blood, fire, and columns of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will come about that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the part that Peter quotes in Acts 2, 17 through 21. Now, in Acts 2, 38... This is the part I was saying about where he emphasizes repentance. He says, brothers, what are we to do? Peter said to them, repent. Each one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So there's the forgiveness of sins that was prophesied in Jeremiah 31, 31, right? God said, I will uh, pardon their wrongdoings or their iniquities and their sin I will remember no more. So Peter says, repent. Again, I know there's at least a couple people in here, and I'm not saying I know who they are, but I'm saying I feel like it's a word of knowledge that, and maybe it's everybody in here, you have to repent. It's not get Jesus and then keep living your life. The very first step before baptism and giving your life to Christ is repenting. Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, um, and this is nothing against my earthly father because he would even tell you that he was only teaching the things that he learned at said Bible college that he went to, is that the emphasis in the church is forgiveness of sins. Would you agree? That's the emphasis. That's what you're taught. Well, you need to get baptized. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. Well, you need Jesus in your life. Why? So you can get your sins forgiven. Why? So I don't go to hell. Great. I don't want to go there. I don't think anybody wants to go there. But that's where, that is the emphasis of the quote-unquote new covenant, and it is not the emphasis that God gives. It's one part of it, but what is the point of forgiving your sins and getting you pure and holy if not to open up the house, the temple of God, so that he can come and reside in there? Forgiveness of sins simply empties the house. 
you know what the Bible says? That it says, um, you know, when, when a demon is driven out, it says he goes about waterless places, and then he comes back, and then he finds that the house is swept clean, and he gets seven friends worse than he is, and goes back in, and the state of that person is worse than before. That would be the same thing of getting forgiveness of sins and not being filled with the Holy Spirit. You're just empty. Now, you're empty of sin, which is a really good thing, but we have to fill the temple. The, body is, the, the Bible calls our body the temple of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit isn't living on the inside of you, then it's not a temple. It's just an empty house. And I know some of you are like, yeah, but when I got baptized, the guy baptizing me said, um, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. But then you never hear any teaching about the Holy Spirit. You never hear about the gifts of the Spirit. You never hear about speaking in tongues. You never hear about how we can lay hands on the sick. They will recover. You just hear people say, well, what do we do now? Well, you know, we just say prayers, and then we end every prayer with if it be your will, and then whatever happens after that is God's will, and that's it. Oh, and by the way, you got baptized, you get to take communion now. That's literally what I took away from the idea of what it means to get born again. The emphasis, I'm going to say it again, of the new covenant, the new contract is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot come unless Jesus went back. So Jesus is a huge part of the equation. But I believe his sacrifice has been the singular thing emphasized instead of the idea that no more, if we're like, what do you think God says about this? I don't know. Get out the 616 laws and let's figure it out. No, you can talk to him direct. But because the emphasis of God of the new covenant is get your sins forgiven. Well, now what I do? Well, you need to read your Bible. Well, what are, what are the things I do? Uh, we do a devotion before bed. And I'm not against any of that. But I'm saying, why did God give us the prophetic spirit, the, the Holy Spirit, the new covenant spirit to put on the inside of us if we're not asking him on the daily what to do in our lives? I believe this with all my heart. If you have a business, your business will prosper through the roof if you just ask God what to do. Don't go with the trends. Don't go with, well, what does this say? What is it? Well, this person did this over here. Ask God, what can I do to prosper my business? And people get all weird and like, oh, this sounds like the prosperity gospel. How many of you in here started a business to lose money? Let's not be hypocritical, right? Why would God not want to prosper you, not so you could have money and fancy toys and all of this, but other business people scratching their head going, why does that person seem to know where the trends are going? Why does that person seem to know whatever they designed or whatever they did here and they knew this was going to crash over here? How do they know that? Then that's the opportunity that you can bring unsaved business people to the Lord because you're like, I get downloads from heaven on what to do because God wants to prosper me in the same way that he prospered Joseph to the point that pagans like Potiphar and uh, Pharaoh are like, man, everything this guy touches turns to gold. You ever thought about that? Joseph wasn't the preacher of the gospel. Everywhere he went, when he was in the prison, prison was doing really well. He was actually in prison for, for being accused of something he didn't do. When he was in Potiphar's house, Potiphar's like, man, everything this guy touches is just great. I don't want to give him to anybody. When he was sold into slavery by his brothers, Pharaoh recognized it because he interpreted his dreams and like, God must be with that guy. I want him to be my right hand man because if he's got communication with God, that's only going to help me out. And it, it doesn't say that Pharaoh became a Christian and started serving the one true God. He had his other gods. And actually, in fact, Pharaoh is usually was considered a God. But he recognized that there was something on Joseph that he didn't have. And he's like, I should keep that guy. And, and, what, and you guys know the story. There's redemption with the brothers and all of that. But I think my point in all of this is saying what we think the purpose of the Holy Spirit is just to be able to speak through us to give people the gospel when I can guarantee you that most of the people in this room will not do what I do for a living. So why would you ask the Holy Spirit to do something for you for, when you're not even going to go into that career? He's gifted all of you in different areas. He's gifted some of you. Some of you could just create things. Some of you just know certain things. I know, and this is just a recent example, I know when I talk to, to John Green, he's explaining all this tech stuff, and he's like, yeah, it's really super easy. And I'm like, I don't know. It's not easy to me. 
But it becomes easy to him because he's been anointed to do that, and God has blessed him from that. And honestly, this is the whole purpose of the church because he gets blessed for that, and then he's able to help the church out with their IT stuff because it just comes so natural to him. I wouldn't know how to do that. There's other people in here that work with heating and air conditioning, or maybe you've designed houses and that kind of stuff. I don't know how to do any of that. And, and some people look down on themselves. Oh, I'm just a mechanic. I just work on cars. That's fascinating because other than changing spark plugs and oil and putting air in my tires, I don't know how to do anything else. It's fascinating to me. But isn't it interesting that the things that come so easy to us, we're fascinated by other people's gifts? And sometimes, many things, I'm kind of having these conversations with my kids as they're getting older, because I remember I did this. When you're a kid and you're talented in certain areas, isn't it interesting that because it comes so easy to you, you kind of dismiss that talent and you want the talents of other people and you try to do what they do, but you can't because you weren't anointed to do it. Thank you, Jesus. Wow. Okay, let's go on. So we're going to see now in John all the different places of what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is. I've got these up on the screen so you can just look at the screens. And I'm going to have to go through them quick. Okay, so John, pretty much John 13 through the end of 17, there's this long discourse by Jesus. And he's telling them many things. I want to show you how many times he talks about the Holy Spirit. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another of the same kind. It's important that you understand it. It's another of the same kind. Well, what's another? He's referring to himself because how many of you know Jesus was helping us when he was here? So when he uses the term another helper, the, the Greek definition is another helper of the same kind. And that's important to know because the Holy Spirit is also called the Spirit of Christ, and it's also called the Spirit of God, which is, again, the mystery of the Trinity that we can't fully fathom this side of heaven. And he calls him the helper. The helper in the Greek is an advocate or lawyer who can make the right judgment calls because he is close enough to the situation. I love that. That's what I'm saying. We can tap into heaven. And, and it's not to try to do it to try to gain some advantage. It literally is our covenant. I'm going to take my spirit, God says, and I'm going to put it on the inside of you. Just freely receive it. And I'm going to communicate with you the same way I communicated with Jesus. And I told him to do things, and he did it. And I told him to do this miracle, and he did it. And I gave him power, all of that. It's the same spirit. So he says, I'm going to send you this helper so that he will be with you forever. The helper is the spirit of truth. This is the most common title that's given to the Holy Spirit. He's called the spirit of truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth. So then again, we have the same picture of Jesus that the new covenant spirit of truth that's put on side of us is one with Jesus. He says, whom the world cannot receive because it doesn't see him or know him, but you know him because he remains with you and will be in you. He's talking about the spirit because in, uh, in the gospels, it says first to the 12, he gave his power to them. So he gave them the Holy Spirit. It remained with them. Just like the, the, when the Spirit came on Jesus as a dove, it says that it rested on him. It didn't say it filled the inside of him. I don't think it's a big point to argue, but I'm just telling you what the Scripture said. And the same thing when you read in the Old Testament that the Spirit would come on people. It would come on Saul. And then when Saul started disobeying God, the Spirit lifted and an evil spirit came. And so the Spirit came on people and left people based on God's will and if they were following him. That's what, like, when he's told Saul, hey, Saul, your kingdom is ripped from you. It was when he took the Holy Spirit away. Because how many of you know Saul ended up staying king for, like, 20 years after that? But he was 20 years out of order because David was anointed. But because of humanness, because we don't listen to God, he tried to kill David. David actually didn't take the throne. That was his 20 years prior. So he says, the helper is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive. He remains with you and will be in you. So he's saying he remains with you now, but at Pentecost, he's coming to live on the inside of you. Next verse. Okay, John 14, 26. Again, we're skipping around, not to pull things out of context, but just everything that talks about the Holy Spirit. The helper, which is again the advocate or lawyer who can make the right judgment calls because he's close enough to the situation, also known as the Holy Spirit, 
whom the Father will send in my name. Now, this is important. He says, whom the Father will send. Whom the Father will send in my name. Anytime you say in my name, it means the character, reputation, authority, and cause. So when we tell people to pray over people in the name of Jesus, you hear that phrase a lot, it doesn't really mean that if we use the phrase in the name of Jesus, God will just go, oh, I got to do it now. When we pray in the name of Jesus, it means we're praying in his character, in his reputation, in his authority, and in his cause. The Spirit will teach you all things. All things. Not some things. Not things will comprehend the sight of heaven. All things. And remind you of all things I said to you. Now that is Jesus specifically talking to the apostles about reminding them of the things that he told them for three and a half years. But the Spirit will teach us all things. Next verse. When the Helper comes... Look how Jesus says it this way, whom I will send. Now, some people may think that's a discrepancy because he just said the previous chapter, which is not a previous chapter. He's giving a long dissertation. He said, the Father will send. And now he's saying, I will send. Why? Because he and the Father are one. Whom I will send to you from the Father. So the Father was going to send the Spirit in Jesus' name, but now Jesus is going to send the Spirit From the Father. And he says, known as the Spirit of truth, he proceeds from the Father and will give evidence and testify concerning me. So that means like when people are like, well, I'm just in the Spirit, I'm just in the Spirit. If they're doing things that Jesus wouldn't do, if people that say that they're in the Spirit are representing Jesus of things he wouldn't do, they're of a different spirit. It's important to know that because, again, you know, I've met people that are like, no, you don't understand. This is what the Spirit told me. And I said, no, he didn't. And you know, when you tell people God isn't speaking to them, that can make them mad. But I said, you know how I know God didn't tell you that? I said, because right here in the word, it says this. And that is completely contradictory to what you are saying. And God doesn't contradict himself. Which is why we must know the word, the written word of God. That is our check against what the Holy Spirit is saying so that we make sure that we're not listening to a different spirit. Amen. Listen to me very carefully. The truth is my departure only helps you more. Your Bibles probably say, like, it's, it's to your advantage that I leave. This is fascinating because I think most of us would love to have Jesus in our church service every week. That would be fun. But the bottom line, he is here on the inside of you and on the inside of me, and we are one together every single week. And he says, it's to my advantage. It's to your advantage, excuse me, that I leave. It helps you more. Why? Because Jesus can only be in one place at one time. By the Spirit, he indwells every believer, and we can be everywhere. So he says, if I don't go back to heaven, the helper will not come. So the, the Holy Spirit is dependent on Jesus returning to heaven, which tells me it's the new covenant because Jesus dies on the cross, and he walks around on the earth for a while. We have the breakfast scene. Uh, We have the scene where he tells the disciples to throw their nets on the other side. This is the second time he's done this miracle. But this is after his resurrection. So he says, even though I'm resurrected now and all of this, we cannot complete the process of the new covenant unless I go back to heaven. Because if I don't go, the helper will not come. But he says, but if I go, I will send him to you. Again, he's saying, I will send. And when the spirit comes, he will convict And that word is convince and expose with strong, compelling evidence the world regarding sin, righteousness, or justice, and judgment. Next verse. He says, concerning sin. Now remember, he says, I will convict the world of these things. Not believers, the world. And this goes back into my examples of you know, Bud Light and Target and what everything's going on in this crazy messed up world. He says, concerning sin, which is missing the mark because they do not believe in me. There is an inner conviction. I don't care. They will lie to you. They won't admit it. But everyone out there that is living a sinful life somewhere deep down in the recesses of their heart, when everybody else has gone to bed, before their head hits the pillow, they know what they're doing is wrong. You know how I know this? 
Why is the world trying to get displays in Target? Why is the world trying to get major companies to throw it in your face about who they're sleeping with? That's right, they need affirmation because they know what they're doing is demonic, it's sensual, it's wrong. But if I can get everybody, including those Christians, to admit on their knees that what I'm doing is right, then if they can acknowledge that I'm right, then maybe this guilt that I feel on the inside of me will go away. Because they are missing the mark, and it says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. People know what they're doing is wrong. And when I'm just picking on these big things like transgenderism, that kind of stuff, if, if you are sleeping with someone before marriage or you're cohabitating with someone, you're doing something wrong too. And I bet you there's conviction going on. I don't care how much the world has embraced this. There is an inner conviction of sin that the Holy Spirit brings on the world, which is why the Bible talks about no one will not be held accountable because there's an inner conviction. And the only way that people know how to deal with the inner conviction is to go, well, I, I feel like it's wrong somehow, but if I can get enough people to agree with me, it's right. Maybe this feeling will leave. And we know it doesn't because these very... These very, very bad sins that people are involved in, the suicide rate is high, the drug addiction is high, all of these things, the um, depression is, is off the charts. People living these lifestyles are literally, it's killing them to live these lifestyles. They're mutilating their body. They're making it so they won't be able to reproduce anymore. It is demonic. And we're not mad at them. But if we say that we love them, we should tell them what they're doing to themselves is killing them, and it's wrong. And by the way, after you live a horrific life here of destroying your own body and having all kinds of medical problems, you still have hell to look to, forward to. We need to help people. So he says that the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. He says concerning righteousness, which means justice. He says, because I am returning to the Father and no one will visibly see. So again, he convicts the world of justice. People will say, even if they're not believers, that's not right. That's not fair. This is this and this is this. People have an inner sense of justice that comes only from the Holy Spirit. We have a sense of righteousness, a right and wrong. It comes from the Holy Spirit. And again, people may not admit that, but they know deep down. It goes right along with sin. And then the final one says, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has already, past tense, been judged. How does the Holy Spirit convict the world of judgment? Because if you are not in Christ, you feel the weight of judgment all the time. You even hear people saying it. What do they say? Stop judging me. God's my judge, and they don't even believe in God. Stop judging me. Stop judging me. Stop judging me. You're being a racist. You're doing this. Stop judging. Stop judging. Stop ju You're being a bigot. Stop judging. Stop judging. And what it is, is we're not judging them. They are feeling the in, internal judgment of the spirit of what they're doing is wrong. Why? Because it says the ruler of this world has already been judged, and Jesus himself said, my sheep here my voice. And, when, and then he looks at the crowd and he says, you don't hear my voice, therefore you are of your father, the devil. And so people who feel this judgment on the inside of them for what they're doing is wrong, even though they don't want to admit that what they're doing is wrong, it's because Satan has already been judged and the Satan that they've attached themselves to, which is the God of this world, since he's already been judged, they feel the judgment. And the judgment is right. We're not to judge anybody, but the judgment, the conviction, and the sin that they're feeling on the inside of them, that's tormenting them, that they're, they're taking their own lives, they're cutting themselves, all of that, that, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit is doing that to them, but that comes from the knowledge that there's some kind of turmoil that they're in, and that invites demons to come in and have a field day. So, I've heard this verse preached so many times that they're like, oh, what's the purpose of the Holy Spirit today? They're like, oh, well, this is what it does for the believer. This is what it does for the world. It doesn't convict the believer of sin. Now, if you're ongoing engaged in sin and you kind of feel that feeling, then I would say, yes, it is for you because you're not walking with the Lord. But this stuff is for the unbelievers. The Holy Spirit for you should be love and joy 
and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. The Holy Spirit for you should be power flowing out of you and healing other people. That's what it is for the believer. This is what it is for the world. But the Holy Spirit in most churches has just been boiled down to this and going, this is the role of the Holy Spirit. He's to make you feel bad when you sin. He's to make you feel judged. And he's like, you know, I know I'm dating myself here, but like Pinocchio with Jiminy Cricket. Or, or like you've got like the devil on one shoulder and the angel on the other shoulder. It's, it's ridiculous. The purpose of the new covenant spirit to come and live on the inside of you is so you can talk directly to God. All right, let's keep going. Okay, these are the last verses, and then we'll have the worship team come up. Look what it says in 1 John 2, 20 through 21. He says, you have the anointing from the Holy One, and you know all. Some of your translations say you all know. That is not correct. It's saying you know all. If the God who knows everything is on the inside of you, and he knows everything, then that means you have the capability of knowing everything. And people say, I just don't believe that I can know everything this side of heaven. But could you imagine if you spent 24 hours a day, seven days a week, just hanging out with the Holy Ghost, you'd know a lot more than you do now. And so that's why it's always a choice. That's why we shouldn't get mad at people going, well, I can't believe, you know, they only come to church once a month. I can't believe they don't read their Bible. I can't believe they don't watch other teachers during the week. And and even Christians get all judgy with other people instead of going, listen, it's up to you on how much you want to know from the Lord. I'm I'm not the righteousness police. I'm not the Holy Ghost police. And neither is any of the other leaders here. I found out just from studying this that my job as a pastor is not to give you great wisdom so that you can take my great wisdom and revelation and apply it to your own life. I'm trying to tell you here's how you get your own wisdom and revelation in your own life. What God is going to tell me for wisdom and revelation for me isn't going to be the same for you because you have different lives, different jobs, different families. Before I finish with this, I want to to tell you all to be careful of something. In the Old Testament, the law worked like this. God gave the law, which was a list of rules and regulations, and then he said that he wanted to communicate with the people. In fact, the people said, Moses, we don't want to listen to you anymore. We don't know if you're really hearing from God. We want to hear from God direct. And Moses is like, okay. So he says, you know, cleanse yourself, get by the mountain. God's going to descend and he's going to talk to you. And so that's when the Ten Commandments is given. And then all the people are like, ah, oh, it's so much. If God keeps speaking to us, we'll die. Moses, why don't you just hear from God for us? And then you just give us the message. So they rejected God talking with them directly, and they wanted a list of rules and regulations that they said, if God says it, we can do it. And by the way, we don't want God to talk directly to us. That was just too much, Moses. You just hear from God and tell us. We need to be careful, brothers and sisters, that we did not trade that and, and then recreate something of the same. Well, what am I supposed to do? Well, read your Bibles and be moral. That's the law. Well, I just, I can't hear from God. I don't know how to hear from God. And you know what? I really don't have time to hear from God. So I'm just going to come to church and hear what Pastor Josh says, and I'll just say, receive what he's hearing from God. I understand what I'm saying could put me out of a job. <laughs> And I'm not saying don't come to church, but I'm saying my job as a pastor is to train you on how to get your own revelation and wisdom from God. I'm just sharing with you how I do it. You know, sometimes I've shared with you, I'm like, God didn't speak to me to Saturday night. He was kind of putting me on edge. I didn't have a message. But then when it came, I knew it was him. But see, you don't need God to speak to you that way because you're not standing up and giving a message every week. You have family members that in dire situations you say, Lord, I need a word for them. You know the situation. It's all kinds of messed up. Download it to me. I want to hear from the new covenant spirit, and he's going to give it to you. That's what seven mountains is all about. You see the thing about seven mountains in the government mountain, in the business mountain, all that. That's all of you. You're all in different places. The new covenant spirit is not going to give you the same message that he gives me because I'm not in your mountain. He's going to give messages to you that is able, going to be able to bless you, prosper you, and, in, and infect everyone around you with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and all of those things. And people are going to see how anointed you are and go, I don't know what it is, but I want what you have. He didn't send us out there to go, um, hey, you're going to burn in hell if you don't have Jesus. Read this Bible. That's not what he told us to do. He told us to live supernaturally so that people would want what we have. 
Okay, so we're going to finish with these scriptures. Go, um, go back to the, the other one. You have the anointing from the Holy One. You know all. I'm not writing to you, this is John, because you don't know the truth. He says, I'm writing to you because you do know it. So it's the same thing. When I preach to you, I'm not preaching. You know, they, they say like, well, you're just preaching to the choir. We already know these things. Right. I'm not telling you because you don't know it. I'm telling you because you do know it, and I'm bringing it to your remembrance. He says, I'm writing to you because you know it. Lies have no part of truth. Illusion has no part of reality. Why? Why is he talking about the anointing of the Holy One and then talking about truth? Because he's talking about the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit is called the Spirit of truth. Next verse. The anointing, again, the Holy Spirit you received from him remains in you. You don't need anyone to teach, instruct, or impart knowledge to you. That's that word in the Greek. And again, I know that's dangerous for me to say that because maybe nobody will come next week and go, I don't need Pastor Josh to teach, instruct, or impart knowledge to me anymore. However, as his anointing has taught you and continually teaches you about all things, and is truth, reality, and not a lie, illusion, you shall remain in him as he remains in you. So again, I'm not saying don't hang out with Christians because you know what? How many of us get to places where we're so frustrated we may have gotten in our flesh and we can't hear from God and we may need to, to get some wise counsel to have someone else hear for God for us. I'm not saying that that's not biblical. The Bible talks about seeking out wise counsel. But I'm saying the ultimate goal of the new covenant is God to take his spirit and put it on the inside of you and so that you on the daily basis can hear from God and act out and live out what he's telling you to do. That's the new covenant. We get stuck on this whole, well, he's forgiven my sins. He's forgiven my sins. That's the new covenant. That's the first part of it. He forgave your sins to be able to take himself and put himself on the inside of you, which is why we're one with him and he with us and he and you and you and me, and we're all one together. Now, the only hard part about all of that is, and why it doesn't seem to all play out that way, is because we would rather hear from experts. We'd rather listen to whatever the trending stuff of the world is. We don't want to offend. And so every time we choose to operate the way that the world tells us and not listen to the Spirit, we're cutting God's voice, his prophetic voice off to speaking to us because we're listening to so many other voices. So it's not that God's not speaking. It's just, there's a lot of crowded voices speaking. And we need to shut those off and listen to the new covenant spirit. We could have Pentecost all over again, starting today, and just say from now on, yes, know the written word. Because again, you have to have that to test what you're hearing, what God is saying. But could it be, and my challenge to you is, could you rely more on the Holy Spirit? Could you rely more on when a situation happens on your family instead of going into panic mode, instead of going into, well, I got to do this, I got to do this, I got to do this. Just stop for a minute and go, Holy Spirit, what am I supposed to do? And listen and wait for a response. Well, I'm at my job. I just feel like I'm not affecting people around me. I just, I'm, there, it seems like barriers and demonic things going on. Lord, teach me, do I need to go in here and pray, like maybe in this room or in this room? And who is the person that you're going to highlight to me that, that, that you can already see that their heart is open and ready to receive, but I'm not discerning that. Tell me who that is, Lord. This is how we should live on a daily basis. I'm not there yet. So I don't want to feel like a hypocrite and going, hey, I've been living this way for a long time. It's really great. I still struggle on a week-to-week -week basis to to stop when I'm in the middle of a situation and go, I need to hear from the Lord. And you know what? I believe that hurriedness and busyness and we gotta be on our phones, we gotta do this, and we can't just sit still, that that is a direct attempt by the devil to just keep you in hurriedness and busyness and distraction so that you can't hear his voice. We need to slow down. We need to hear from the Lord. Jesus just walked from town to town. He's just always listening. And then when ministry day is over and he's spent, 
sometimes he said, hey guys, I'm glad we debriefed. I'm going into the mountains because I need to pray and talk to my father all night because I know we're going to have big ministry stuff tomorrow and I need to know what I'm doing because he only relied on what the father told him through the spirit. And so should we. Amen.